Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. This week has left me confused and disoriented, even more so than usual, because I can't figure out whether the tech news is good or bad. Sure, there are juicy Radeon RDNA 3 rumors and cool two nanometer process breakthroughs from IBM that sound like good news to me, but there are also new Spectre exploits and sad AMD X370 motherboard owners and a worsening drought in Taiwan that are definitely bad news. It's almost as if the dual nature of the universe has somehow been distilled into today's show, representing the eternal struggle betwixt that which is pure and right and true and the corrupting forces of evil that constantly seek to envelop us in bitter crappiness. And if that seems extra dramatic to you, that's probably because it is, but it sounded way better to me than saying, the tech news had its ups and downs this week. Excellent! Corsair has expanded their new case lineup with the 5000 series, a premium chassis with three versions available, the sleek 5000D, the 5000D Airflow, and the 5000X with tempered glass panels and three 120mm air guide RGB fans. A spacious interior provides room for multiple radiators or up to 10 120mm fans, and there are tons of convenient features for building like hinged removable panels, flexible storage options for hard drives or SSDs, and rapid route cable management guides. Available in black or white, so click the sponsor link in the description for more. If there's one thing that AMD fans love about Ryzen CPUs since the first gen launched back in 2017, it's the upgrade path and CPU cross compatibility that has allowed many early adopters to swap in new silicon a year or two or three later. And if there's one thing that AMD fans love to hate, it's anything that seems to restrict that cross compatibility, especially for seemingly arbitrary reasons. While AMD did make good on their promise to support the AM4 socket until 2020, some customers were disappointed that the earliest 300 series AMD AM4 motherboards topped out with support for third gen Ryzen CPUs or the 3000 series, even though there is a legitimate argument to be made regarding BIOS ROM sizes and support for such a wide array of chips. Now, even though they're not supposed to, ASRock has made moves to work around AMD's guidance by building beta BIOS versions for the X370 motherboards that support AMD's latest Ryzen 5000 series processors like the 5900X. Since support for beta BIOSes falls to the motherboard manufacturer, which is quite literally how B450 and X470 motherboards are supporting 5000 series CPUs right now with beta BIOS versions, ASRock should be in the clear to skirt the rules and make some of their X370 motherboard owners happy by adding 5000 series CPUs. Support. But AMD said no, at least according to a hardware Lux user who posted part of this email exchange with ASRock. We received AMD's warning that X370 shouldn't support Vermeer CPUs, Vermeer being the code name for the 5000 series. Now, I don't know if anyone from AMD is watching, but if you are, consider this. Apart from a PR hit on some level, the group you're disappointing here is 300 series motherboard owners. These are early adopters who took a chance on an unproven platform back in 2017, when AMD CPUs were still the butt of industry-wide jokes, and Intel's plan to ship mainstream 14 nanometer quad cores indefinitely was still totally viable. Show some gratitude to these people, lift your draconian restrictions, and let the beta BIOSes roam free. I mean, all you have to do is give the okay and leave the support to the motherboard manufacturers. If you say no, I will be sad. And the only thing that might lift my spirits would be rumors of an epic new Radeon GPU with wildly optimistic performance claims. Hey look, it's rumors of an epic new Radeon GPU with wildly optimistic performance claims. If you can ignore the ongoing GPU shortage for a moment, which is a tall order, I know, but try your best, then consider that that RDNA 2, the GPU architecture that powers the RX 6800 XT and 6900 XT, is actually quite good. It has closed the performance gap with NVIDIA in many ways and has allowed Radeon to compete with GeForce RTX GPUs even at the high end at least in a fantasy world where graphics cards can be purchased at or near MSRP. So it is interesting to watch rumors swirl about our DNA 3, the next generation GPU architecture that Team Radeon has in the works. The biggest news is the potential for a chiplet-based design that would allow AMD to fit multiple dies onto the same package, similar to how Ryzen 8-core chiplets are used to build 16-core, 32-core, and 64-core threader per CPUs. To handle chip-to-chip -chip communication, there's already AMD patents out for active bridge technology, essentially the GPU equivalent to Infinity Fabric. Beyond that, we have three potential RDNA 3-based GPU configurations, and please remember that these are all still rumors sourced from frequent but often accurate leaker 
Kitty Yuko, or Yuko Yoshida, on Twitter, as well as investigations by Red Gaming Tech and WCCF Tech. Navi 33 is the lower end part, but will sport a similar configuration to Navi 21, the RDNA 2 based chip that powers the 6800 and 6900 XT with 80 compute units and 5120 cores, meaning we could expect flagship 6900 XT type performance, but in a mid range card. Navi 32 and 31 are higher end and will use a two chip configuration, still with 80 compute units and 5120 cores, but also with true RDNA 3 architecture and, you know, two chiplets, doubling the specs to as many as 160 compute units and 10,240 stream processors. Combine the raw spec increases with gains from the new architecture and the move to TSMC's 5 nanometer node, which could deliver 15% higher frequencies and 30% power reduction, and Kitty Yuko saying 2.5x is too little in terms of performance gains versus RDNA 2 makes a bit more sense. There will also be hardware based ray tracing, and if AMD manages to successfully roll out FidelityFX Super Resolution 2, we could be looking at an even more heated battle for GPU supremacy than expected with the next gen parts. The only downside, apart from these all being rumors, is is that these cards probably won't launch until 2022 or 2023. And there's that TSMC 5 nanometer node. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company will be manufacturing not only these RDNA 3 GPUs, but AMD's next gen Zen 4 chips, Nvidia's next gen Hopper GPUs, and Intel's new XE GPUs, all with the new 5 nanometer process node, along with all those console chips that they are currently backlogged on for PS5 and Xbox. So let's hope things go smoothly in the near future for TSMC. Oh, crap. Uh, remember that drought in Taiwan that I told you guys about back in March? Let's cycle back to some bad news again with an update there. It has not gotten better. In fact, Taiwan is currently suffering from the most terrible drought they've had in 56 years. And the three major technology parks on the west side of the island where TSMC's fabs are located are bracing for the worst, since a stable supply of fresh water is vital for semiconductor production. With reservoirs at critical levels, the Taiwanese government has tried transferring water between reservoirs, stopping water supply for agriculture, reducing water supply for households, drilling groundwater water wells, desalinating seawater, and even using military planes to dump cloud seeding chemicals in hopes of triggering rain. But even with these measures, the Central Taiwan Science Park is expected to run out of water and be forced to stop production in July, and the Southern Science Park will likely have to shut down in August. Rainfall in the seven months through February was less than half the historic average, and no typhoons hit Taiwan at all in 2020. They usually get seven to nine each year. The plum rains, as they are known, should be picking up soon though, as they come to Taiwan in spring and summer, so there is hope that the weather might change for the better. But for the sake of the people of Taiwan, and for the greater good of the semiconductor industry that is currently relying on TSMC for so many sought after products, let's all do a rain dance and uh, keep our fingers crossed. You might have heard about IBM producing two nanometer chips this week, and indeed they did announce some big strides forward. They can now pack 50 billion transistors onto a chip the size of a fingernail, up from 30 billion back in 2017. And although fingernail based measurement standards are a bit inaccurate, it's the two nanometer description that warrants further scrutiny. Scrutiny. Manufacturing process measurements used to refer to the minimum wire distance in 2D planar chips, but manufacturing has moved on from 2D designs for a while now, ever since Intel introduced 3D FinFET transistors with their 22 nanometer designs, transistors have gone vertical instead of horizontal. So 2 nanometers is a bit of an abstraction. IBM is saying that if you could continue to shrink 2D planar designs without crosstalk interference issues, the number of transistors you'd be able to fit with a 2 nanometer process is about how many transistors by area that they have fit on this prototype wafer. But they are using nano sheet or gate all around technology, even though no part of the design actually measures two nanometers. That said, IBM is claiming that their design is 45% faster versus existing seven nanometer chips with 75% less power used, which is nice. IBM and Intel announced a research partnership back in March. So Team Blue potentially looks to be a benefactor of the new tech, although actual consumer hardware based on it isn't expected until late 2024 at the earliest. If you'd like to learn more about IBM's design or semiconductor technology in general, check out the YouTube chan channel Tech Tech Potato. It's Dr. Ian Cutress's channel. He's a senior editor at Anantech, and watching his videos will make you smarter, just like I did. So lots of ups and downs in the tech news this week, but you know what else can go up and down? Tech briefs. 
The RTX 3080 Ti is that rumored GPU that just doesn't seem to want to launch, to the point that we're sick of hearing about it. But just FYI, the new new and super confirmed and definitely legitimate launch date now is June 2nd, with a May 31st announcement just a few days prior. Also, there's a 3070 Ti 2 that will probably launch on June 9th. We promise, pinky swear and all that. The 3080 Ti is expected to retail for $999, but my prediction is that there will be like three of them for that price, and then board partners will sell aftermarket versions for twice that or more because they've abandoned any pretense of siding with their customers when there's huge mountains of cash to be made. With GPUs in short supply, one might think that the industry is suffering, but in fact, they are doing quite well. Semiconductor revenue hit 464 billion US dollars in 2020 and is expected to surpass 522 billion across the industry in 2021. So chips are being produced, they are just also being bought at a record pace, with components for PCs and servers in particular growing 17.3% year over year to 160 billion in 2020. Let's hope that drought in Taiwan doesn't slow things down. Researchers from the University of Virginia and University of California San Diego published a paper this week describing three new types of specter attacks that target vulnerabilities in the micro op caches that modern Intel and AMD CPUs use for branch prediction. Fixing the problem via a microcode update will likely reduce performance severely, but fortunately this type of attack is inherently difficult because it would have to bypass all other security measures that a PC or server had in place. So if you're not hiding nation state level secrets on your system, then you're probably not at risk of being targeted. Intel promised further investment in their manufacturing capabilities Monday with a $3.5 billion sum earmarked for their Rio Rancho campus in New Mexico. Here they won't be making chips, but packaging them with Intel's new 3D technology technology known as Foveros that allows die-to-die -die packaging, connecting two chips together directly. They'll also continue development of Intel's embedded multi-die interconnect bridge or EMIB technology. The 3.5 billion is in addition to the 20 billion Intel announced they'd be spending on factories back in March, and the Rio Rancho expansion is set to break ground in late 2021, with production spinning up by late 2022. Back in 2017, the United States FCC asked the public for feedback on net neutrality, the concept that internet service providers should treat the data you access on the internet equally. 22 million comments were submitted, but only about 4 million were actually unique American voices. This week, the New York State Attorney General revealed that 8.5 million anti-net neutrality comments were fabricated through an industry campaign run by Broadband for America, an umbrella group that includes Comcast, Charter, AT&T, Cox, and CenturyLink. To be fair, there were fake pro-net neutrality comments submitted as well, including 7.7 .7 million by one 19-year-old computer science student, but he used randomly generated names, whereas the BFA campaign used the names and actual contact info of real people, some of who were dead, which feels pretty identity thefty to me. Regardless, the system was clearly flawed and allowed for a wide array of exploits. But even though independent investigations found that 98.5% of the 4 million actual not fake comments were in support of net neutrality, the FCC chairman at the time still repealed the rules. Because he's Ajit Pai, and let's face it, that's what he was going to do the whole time anyway. Meanwhile, in the time since the repeal happened, internet pricing in the US has gone up 19% four times faster than inflation. Finally, the storage-based cryptocurrency Chia launched this week on Monday, and now SSD and hard drive prices are up 500%. I'm, I'm just kidding. Chia totally tanked all week, dropping from its $1,600 launch price all the way down to a low of $563.29. I was all set to end on this high note for the week, but then I checked again, and uh, on Friday, Chia managed to rally to back up over $1,000, uh, but now it's dropped back down to what? 909. So believe it or not, cryptocurrency prices fluctuate all the time, so we'll just have to wait and see how things move from here. On the plus side though, I checked and storage does seem to still be readily available, at least here in the US, with sub $100 one terabyte SSDs in stock and ready for purchase. Now, if only they were bundled with a, an RTX 3070 at MSRP or something. We can dream, can't we? So there you have it guys, tech news for the week, and if it was a roller coaster, I hope you at least enjoyed the ride and kept your lunch down. Let me know how you're liking my tech news series though, I'm doing it every week on Sunday. Your feedback is always welcome, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all of the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading, and you can also click the like button. If you enjoyed the video, check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options. I am sold out of my Imperial Pint glasses for the beer sets right now, by the way, but more are on order and they'll be arriving soon. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more tech videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.